<clears throat> okay. My name is Brendan. Um, I have a background. I've done some filmmaking, but I kind of have a really diverse background. I went to college at the Art Institute of Houston. I majored in interactive media design, which was basically just graphic design, video production, and web design thrown into one thing. So I just kind of have a lot of knowledge on a lot of different things. And then from there, I went and I worked at a TV station in Houston, uh, KIAH. I did graphics for the evening news. Um, I did that job for almost 10 years. I went through the transition from standard definition to high definition with all of the production equipment. And then I even went through a format change for our news program. Um, it was a, originally just kind of a regular evening news program that we did. And then they did a drastic change that, to something that I call uh, news for the ADD generation. It was a voiceover and then just packages, constant voiceover and packages. Um, for better or for worse, it was interesting to see how it, would, it developed over time. Um, from there, I went to a yoga studio. I was their marketing coordinator. Um, and for that, I did all of their marketing uh, creative type stuff. I did the, the graphic design, the video production, the, uh, the web design, their social media stuff. Um, and so there again, it was just kind of a, a broad, a broad amount of uh, things that I did. And so from there, I moved up to Olympia, Washington um, to be closer to my folks. And I got involved with the Olympia Film Collective. Um, it's just a group of folks that they like to get together and they make films and it's really fun. Um, you should definitely connect with them on Facebook. There's a Facebook page and group and stuff. Um, and so yeah, so if you're looking to get more involved, that's a good place to go. Um, if you're looking for crew, if you're looking for just helping out on other people's projects, um, any of that kind of stuff, um, good place to go. Um, obviously, TC Media is a great place to go as well. Um, I was a board member for Olympia Film Collective for a while. And I uh, just learned a lot with them. And I just I kind of want to keep giving back to the community to help give more tips and tricks for what you can do from a producing standpoint. Um, if you look at your, uh, your packet, I'm sorry if you guys could share, because I stole the other one. When you're producing anything, you need some kind of a script or a, uh, just something that you're, you're basing it off of. So there's places you can go. You can go to Olympia Film Collective for, uh, they have a script writing group that you can just say, hey, do you guys have any scripts that you think would be good to be made? And they might be like, oh yeah, we've got one, here you go. And you could work with them to develop the script and move forward from there. There's Facebook groups for screenplay writing. Uh, you could create a, a Film Freeway screenplay competition. Does any, everybody know what Film Freeway is? Let's start there. Yes, no, no, okay, there's enough no's. Film Freeway is a place for f uh, film competitions and festivals. It, you can distribute uh, to film festivals straight from this website. They're always advertising on there. You can find free film festivals around the country and around the world, and you can find paid for ones from around the world. Um, I do think a lot of the big ones use that one, but I don't know for sure. And then the other thing you can do is purchase rights to a short story or novel and adapt that into a screenplay, finding a screenwriter from Facebook or the Film Collective. Going into crew, I'm not gonna cover a lot of the crew. Um, let me just ask, are there any questions about specific crew roles? No, okay. There are two roles that I wanna cover just because they're very important from a producing standpoint. And that is a weapons master for obvious reasons, recently with the film Rust, with uh, Alec Baldwin tragically killing someone on set. Um, 
Unfortunately, that's not the first time this has happened. Um, I don't know every instance that it's happened, but the, la the one that always rings for me is the crow when Brandon Lee was, was shot on set as well. And so that's an important role that if you're gonna have anything that's dangerous on set, whether it's a gun or some special effects explosion from the ground, be safe, make sure that you're, the people in charge of those things know what they're doing. Um, then the second thing is craft services. Craft services is important because of food allergies. There, are, there is a secondary thing, which would be food aversions, because in general, you just want everyone to be happy on your set. Um, but food allergies are obviously more important because you don't want anyone getting sick on set. That's not good for the person that it happens to. It's not good for the project, because you're going to have to divert resources and take care of it. Um, just be very careful. Make sure you're asking everybody involved if they have any allergies and make sure you're addressing them if needed. Like if needed. So those are the two important uh, crew th things that I wanted to talk about. Um, for cast, um, finding cast, you can find people in your regular life. Uh, you've got local theaters, local schools. You can hold auditions. Um, and then you have Facebook groups. There's Oli Film, as I've already mentioned. There are, there's Tacoma Film Alliance. They're close enough that that's just a whole other area of people that you can find actors for, from. Um, and then really anybody on the street or the grocery store or your neighbor, just ask them. You know, they might be like, you know, I've never thought about doing that, but if you think I would be good for it, sure. Just ask. Just don't be creepy about it. Just say, hey, you would be interesting for this role and see if, how they feel about it. Um, locations, it's another just ask. If you go into a bar downtown and you're like, man, this place would look really cool for X short film that I've got that I'm working on. Just ask the, the bartender, say, hey, who's in charge of of like just who's the manager, I guess, and then move from the manager to whoever, if the owner, if you need to. Um, so with locations, just ask. And then there's be creative. You can always find different um, different ways to shoot things. One of those it would be forced perspective. Um, forced perspective is just kind of a cool thing. Uh, Lord of the Rings is probably one of the most famous uses of it because you had Gandalf, who was a very tall wizard, and then you had, uh, is it Bilbo in that one? Good Lord, I'm forgetting. No, it's Frodo. Frodo is very short, and so the actors are not that differentiated in height. And so what they did was they had one actor stand closer to the camera than the other to make them look like they were different heights. And so that's something you can always take into account when, uh, when shooting a scene. If you're like, I really need something to work, there's got to be ways around it. Look on YouTube, look, just Google it, and you can probably find some kind of answer. So, producer's role. There are typically three parts of production. You've got pre-production, production, and post-production. For preparing a foundation for your project, you want to, you want to start with an email address because with an email address, you have opportunities to market your project later. Like I said earlier, I have a diverse background in marketing mainly, more so than filmmaking. And so that's kind of where my brain goes, is what's gonna be the easiest way to make all of these pieces fall in line? And so getting an email with Google, if you don't have the name of your short film yet, have a production company name that you can then use to create your Facebook account. And then from that, you can create Facebook pages for each of your projects. Um, at some point, it'll be good to have an email for your specific project because Instagram, for instance, won't always let you use the same email address. So starting there and then immediately create your social media pages. Kind of get that out of the way to begin with because then everything will be a little bit easier later marketing. 
Um, and then as you're creating those pages, invite your friends and family and crew and cast and everybody that's going to be involved with it. That way you have a place for everybody to post. If everybody else is posting to the page for you, that's less work for you to have to do. Um, make sure that they're posting in ways that you would prefer them to post. Um, like if you're specifically to wanting hashtags in your posts, let them know, hey, put hashtags in it. And if you have the po uh, posts of actors, make sure you're tagging the actors or let somebody know so that they can tag the actors if you're not friends with them on Facebook, that kind of stuff. Um, creating a website, this is not as important to me at this point as social media, but I do think that a film with a website looks more enticing and more credible than a film that doesn't have one. Because it's kind of like, well, you're taking that little bit of effort, eff extra effort to create a site to then share from that platform which just, it makes you look a little bit bigger. And sometimes looking a little bit bigger can get your audience a little bit more behind you. Um, from there, you're gonna create like a cloud folder system. Um, you start with the, uh, basically the project Bible, which would include your log line, which is about 75 words or less. Short description, think of this as your 30 second elevator pitch. You have your tagline, tagline's much shorter, going to be maybe a sentence or two. Um, and then your story treatment will be like an outline. These are the big things that are happening. Um, and then character profiles. Character profiles and story treatments they're kind of up to you. If you're doing a short film that's two or three minutes, may not be necessary to do these. Um, if you're doing a, 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 a feature, hour and a half to two hour movie, it might be helpful for later when you're writing the script so that you can think about, uh, like with a character profile, if you're trying to write a character situation, you kind of know the character a little bit better to be like, oh, in this situation, they would probably do this. So it's just, it's kind of more for you to know your characters better than for the audience to know your characters better. And so I kind of just created a folder system the way I would do it for if I'm setting up a project. If I was the motion designer that was creating the credits, I would have my own system for filing things. But in my mind, this is how I would do it if I'm doing a producing role. Oh, I went into marketing first. So for marketing, and the one thing I would say with this is if you're doing a Gmail account, I would do this on your Google Drive. I wouldn't do this on your hard drive just because then nobody else has access to it. If it's on Google Drive, you can share these files and be like, oh, you're going to help me break down the script. Here's a link to the script. Here's a link to the files where I'm keeping my notes. Boom. All of that's shared. Um, and so... For marketing stuff, immediately I would have a behind the scenes photos folder and I would give this link to everybody involved with the, with the short or project. Um, this way, in the beginning, they know where to go to give you any background behind the scenes stuff that you could find helpful later. All of this could be used for social media posts. They could be used for any kind of promotional trailer because um, you could play that area for a, a promo. Just be like, hey, look at all of our local community people that helped create this short. Um, when you're thinking about trailers, and this is way off topic at the moment, but when you're thinking about trailers, it's all about getting people's attention. And so for me, with short films, especially a local film, I would be happy to know that they're local film and local filmmakers and stuff that would entice me to watch it a little bit more. With the logo, that can be as simple as just text. Just use the same text all the time so that it is a part of your short film, or your project, I keep saying short, it doesn't have to be a short film, um, so that your, your branding is kind of in order. When someone says, hey, I want to advertise for you, 
you want to have all of your branding elements ready to, to give over to them immediately. Because if you don't, their, their excitement about your project could die down a little bit, and then they don't advertise it as well as they might have. Um, and so that would be a logo, poster design, same thing. At some point, you're going to want a poster design. Or we're in the streaming age. Maybe you don't need a poster, per se. Maybe it's a uh, just like a thumbnail image that you know you're going to use for YouTube and Vimeo or whatever platform you're, you're putting your project on. And then social media. And then inside social media, I would have every social media platform you're using. Social media is a crazy thing because there's so many social media platforms. So as a producer, you kind of are going to want to pick and choose which social media outlets you use based on your project. If your project lends more to a younger crowd, advertise on the, the social media platform for the younger crowd. Use a TikTok more than a Facebook. If you're advertising to an older person, use Facebook probably more than TikTok because Facebook is kind of more in that area. And so you don't have to use all of them. If you feel like you just have the time to advertise on all of the social media platforms, go for it. It can only kind of help you because you're just adding awareness for other people. So the main ones that I'll, I'll really discuss briefly would be Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And all of these, I would all utilize them in different ways. I wouldn't make the same posts on both, or like on Instagram and Facebook. I wouldn't post to Instagram and then share directly to Facebook. For one, the algorithm doesn't see that in the same way, and so it's better to post directly onto Facebook. But outside of that, I wouldn't use the same images on both platforms, because one, demographics are different, so it's gonna be different people that are reacting to them. And if I'm a person that I'm on Facebook and Instagram, you're not really giving me a reason to sh follow you on both. Because at that point, I'm just seeing the same stuff on your Facebook as your Instagram. I only need to follow one. So I think it's a good idea to have different posts for different platforms because they will, uh, it just, it gives more reason to follow you if people are really trying to keep up. So then we'll go into pre-production. I would have a folder for script. And with that, all of your drafts for your script can go here. First draft you get from the writer goes there. You can, inside this folder, you can create more folders to organize however it works best for you. But if you have a folder where your script is, you always know where it is. It's easy to share, especially if it's on Google Drive. You can easily archive old scripts. So your newest script is where it needs to be. Um, and then that way you're, you have a good place to put stuff. From there, we're going to go to breakdown, the script breakdown. Once you have your script figured out, you're going to break it down and you're going to go through the script. You're going to go through it with like a fine tooth comb. You're going to go, OK. This is a prop. I need this to shoot the film. So I'm going to highlight it, and I would color coordinate them because you have locations, you have actors, you have uh, props, you have special effects that you might have in your script. So you're going to want to label them color coordinated, maybe, however it works best for you. But then you'll go through it and you'll find every element that you know you're going to have to find to shoot this film. Um, obviously, there's equipment that isn't going to be on the script breakdown, because that's more going to be the, the director's role in finding all the equipment. But for the producer, you're going to be working on finding all of the necessary things for the uh, script. So that's the breakdown. From there, you're going to go to budget. Oops. And you're going to go, OK, I did my script breakdown. These are all the things I need for the script. It's going to cost me x amount of dollars to do this. It's going to cost me x amount of dollars to do this. And then from there, you can find out how much you're going to need to make that, that project. For me, I would get creative. I would go, OK, 
what on here can I find that I don't have to pay for? What could I barter for? What, anything that I can do, like say as a prop, you need a hair dryer. Well, you probably don't need to buy a hair dryer. You pr might have one at home. You might know somebody that has one. You can probably make something like that work. And so even in the budgeting stage, if you wanted to make mental notes for yourself, but when you take a, a budget to uh, like somebody that might help fund it, just give them the whole budget and have them look at it, and then they'll tell you what they're willing to give you. Um, I don't work on many projects where I make like I go out and get money. Not really my thing. I like working on like small DIY type projects. And so finding money is not really something I do a lot of. So then moving from the budget, yeah, you just kind of want to know what you're going to end up needing to make the film. Then legal documents. Inside legal documents, inside legal documents you're going to have waivers, location releases, and allergies. All caps. I just can't stress allergies enough. I've been on sets where things happen where people get hurt. It's never fun, and that's something that's really easy to avoid. Just got to ask everybody, and then you have your location where you know everybody's allergies are. So when you have craft services, whether it's you or it's going to be a, uh, like you're hiring out for catering, give them the allergies. Then there's no excuse for that not to be taken into account. If there's an actor on set that has a peanut allergy, make sure that all of the peanuts are away from anything that the, that person's going to eat. Um, and so, yeah. So I think that's the last time I'll talk about allergies. These ones I actually didn't make a folder for, so we'll just not go there. So I've got casting. Have a folder for casting. Have all of your documentation there. If you have people sending you uh, auditions from their phone, you have a folder. Put them there. This is just gonna help you in the long run because you'll have everything in one location to where you can just go find it real quick and you're like, oh, this actor canceled on us. Who was our second pick? If you have this well organized, you're gonna know really quick. Um, shot list. Shot list is going to be more in the director's side of things. The director will generally work with the director of photography on a shot list. But just so that you know what it is if you don't, a shot list is every shot that they're going to need for the project labeled out the kind of shot it is, the angle of the shot, whether the, it's going to be like a pan in or a zoom out or a tilt. Any of that kind of stuff would be on the shot list. Not something that the producer has to worry about, but just something to good, know, good to know about. Um, there's overhead shot diagrams, again, this is more of a director of photography thing. Um, the, <clears throat> the overhead shot diagram is if you take this set and you label out, you're going to have camera here, here, there, and there. And your lighting is going to be here, 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 and here. And you put those out like an architectural design almost. That way, when you go to set, you know what you're going to shoot. I've been on sets where it takes them a while to set up because they're constantly, should we do this, should we do that? And then there are other people that show up with a shot diagram and they set it up and they're ready. I think the shot diagram can save time, but I do also think anytime you get onto a set, there's gonna be things that you might not have thought about or things that you didn't know about the room or anything like that, where you're still going to have to do a little adjusting, but it still probably saves you some time. Again, director of photography thing. A storyboard is just drawings of your shots. You would take your shot list, you draw out what your goal for that shot to look like is. And this is another thing where not everybody's an artist. Sometimes these are just stick figures. If that's where your drawing level is and you understand what you're trying to shoot, that's the important part. Scheduling. Scheduling is a big part of the producer's role. Um, they may have someone under them doing the scheduling, 
but it's still in, in the producer's like hierarchy of things. And so with scheduling, you're figuring out the days you're shooting, you're figuring out what actors you need on set that day, you're figuring out what props need to be set that, on set that day. Um, really anything for any individual day. Craft services, making sure that they're gonna be there that day. Um, and then just labeling it out in uh, basically a Google Sheet would be good and saying what you need, whose needs to be there, and then having call sheets made. Call sheets go into the individual people on your cast and crew that are gonna need to be there for a specific day. So if I'm doing sound for a project next weekend, I would get a call sheet that would say, Brendan, we need you here at this time, this date. Here are the other people that are gonna be there. These are the times they're gonna be there. Um, this obviously varies from producer to producer because some people do more than others. That's the pre-production stuff for a producer. So we'll go into production. You have a folder for your shooting script. A shooting script uh, takes your script and adds a little bit more explanation on the technical side of things. If they're going to have a track system so that you can do a nice move in or out they're gonna have something like, they're gonna say, we'll dolly this shot or something like that in a shooting script. Where in, the in your, your pre-production script, it's strictly the story, that's it. And any kind of visuals you need for the story. Um, so the shooting script just gets a little more, more technical. And then call sheets, I already went into, so I won't really go into too much again. Um, I will just say for this, there's, you can do it any way that you want organizationally. Um, you could do individual folders for each shooting day and then just have e a folder for the day and then each person that you need for that day. Or you could do an individual folder for the cast and crew and then what days you need that cast and crew. That way, that's really just kind of an up to you kind of thing. Uh, post-production. For post-productions, I would have folders for Director's notes for the editor. The director is the vision maker. The editor takes all the raw footage, puts it together to create the director's vision. Might as well have a place where the director can put their notes and where the editor knows where they'll be so that they have access to them. Um, a lot of the directors and editors might be the same person, so in that case, it's not a big deal. Um, in other instances, it may be two different people that don't have time to meet up all the time, which this would be even more important. So it's kind of varying levels of importance, but it's good to have. For editing, this is where I would put your, as you're getting copies of the, uh, the edited file from the editor, I would have a folder here for that. This is gonna be your editing folder. This is where you know all of the drafts will be. I would save all the drafts because you never know when you're going to be like, wait, in this scene, it used to do this. And I think that looked better. And then you got to find what you're talking about sometimes because you may not remember how you did it or exactly how to explain it to someone. And so keeping all of these is good because then you can go back and be like, so in this instance, it did this. And I would prefer to do that. Just saves you a little bit of headache in the long run. Um, if you have to explain stuff. Uh, special effects script and list or list. That would be good for if you have special, special effects shots in your script. Um, and this is mainly for post-production special effects. If you're getting someone to go into After Effects to add in like muzzle flares for a gun, or if you're doing uh, just even motion graphics like credits you have in the opening credits, you're gonna have stuff come in. If you are doing something more than an editor would do, because an editor, if they're just putting text over clips, an editor will generally do that for opening credits. But if you want something a little more detailed where there's like an animation that goes into it with it and over the video, 
you might put that in your special effects list and then talk to whoever's going to be in charge of special effects to have them ha get that kind of thing accomplished. Um, then there is distribution. Oh, no, wait, credits first. Credits, just talked a little bit about it. You have opening and closing. Th there's been so many different ways of doing credits over the year. It's kind of whatever you want to do. Um, they used to do really heavy credits in the beginning, then have the movie. We've come to a point now where like the important things are credited in the beginning, and then there's a big credits at the end. Um, but it's whatever you want to do. If you're doing something that's supposed to look like a 50s project, do the credits at the beginning just to make it look more like that era. Um, and so the uh, credits are something that I really like. I did motion design at a TV station where I did mo like animated graphics for different kinds of uh, projects. And so credits is kind of just something that I like to watch now. Um, and so it's something I, I like to think about. Now we're to distribution. Distribution is kind of the area that I feel like I want to specialize in with film now. Just because I think it's really interesting. Well, one, when I do decide to start fleshing out my projects, I want to know how to get them to the world. But I also just think that distribution is interesting because I'm kind of a marketing nerd to where that's all distribution is. is. You're trying to figure out the best way to market whatever project you have is. And so within this, you have a few different options for distribution. You have theatrical release, which that's sometimes sounds daunting. But what you also have to remember is just because you're thinking of it as a theatrical release doesn't mean it has to be at a theater. You don't necessarily need to go rent out a room at Regal Theaters to show your short film. You could go to a coffee shop downtown and say, hey, could we put up a screen here and do a screening next Tuesday night? That's an easy way, somewhat cost effective. You got to figure out the screen and projector. Um, but it's a way that you can get your product to people. And at a coffee shop, they have an audience already. There's people coming in and out of coffee shops all the time. So if you have your short playing there, maybe people sit down and watch. And then that's one person that's seen it. So then when you say, hey, this is on YouTube as well, tell your friends, they may go tell their friends. And word of mouth is always going to be the best form of marketing, no matter how we try to market otherwise. Social media marketing, broadcast marketing, they're all good for getting brands in people's brains, but we trust other people usually more than the company telling us what to do. And so I think word of mouth is always going to be the most important marketing uh, platform. And so to me, getting your project in front of people's eyes will be most important. And so like I said with theatrical releases, instead of thinking of, uh, well, if you do want to do it in a big theater, this is one thing, uh, a, a little thing that I, I remember happening back in 2012. There was a movie called The Story of Luke. Um, anybody heard of it? No? Great movie. Awesome. Um, it's a great movie. It's about an autistic kid who goes and lives with his family that is not used to being around him. And in a... In a nice heartfelt way he kind of shows them how all how to be better people it's a great film i definitely recommend anybody see it but one thing that they did with their marketing that was a really good idea they worked with a national charity called autism now to go through to present their film so now you're showing a a group of people that doesn't get shown in film enough, that they have a platform that is people that are advocating for them, that they, they're gonna help you market your movie. So if you have something like that, where you're like, oh, this kind of, 
This is a good for state parks because I'm doing a short film about how state parks are good. Well, go talk to somebody from the state parks department. Maybe they'll go, huh, maybe we could give you resources in some way, give you access to parts of a park that other people don't have access to. Maybe the parks department would give you a little bit of money since you're doing that. You just never know. And maybe they would let you come out throughout the summer to different state parks and show your film. Um, so working with an organization is always a good idea. You have local theaters, you have Capitol Theater. You could rent a hall yourself. You could go to a coffee shop, restaurant, uh, city parks. I know somewhere over here on Harrison, they have done movies out of the park. I think it's actually called Central Park. And they generally do like feature films. But if you go and you're like, hey, would you guys mind shoot, playing my short film before you do your feature film? They might do it. And then that way, that's another, another avenue where you're getting your name out there that you wouldn't otherwise just by asking. Um, a local gallery. There's art galleries all over in Olympia. They're promoting art. You're an artist, not their typical artist that they work with, but you're an artist nonetheless. And if people come to a screening at their gallery to see your art, they might buy their art as well. So it's a win-win for both people. Um, someone's backyard. If, if you just have a friend that has like a fun backyard that you just want to show it and show it to your friends and family, that's a way to get it out there. And this last one, this is one that I really enjoy the thought of. I played in a band about 10 years ago um, called Smoking Spore that we did uh, two small tours um, from Texas up to North uh, New York on one, and then we mainly went over to Florida on the other. But it's kind of an interesting experience, and it's something that I've seen other filmmakers do. That uh, is anybody aware of Kevin Smith? Kevin Smith is a basic, mainly comedy writer, but what he did a, a long time ago at this point was he goes from city to city when he has a new film coming out, and, and uh, he does a showing of the film, and then he does a, a question answer seg segment afterwards, and he sells out places everywhere, and it's a great way to get people seeing your product. It's interesting because it's like you're going to a movie and a comedy club because the way he presents his Q&A, he's almost like a comedian. Um, and he's just a really good storyteller. And so that's a way that you could think about doing it. I'm actually working with someone now that I think I'm going to pitch this idea for their next project, is to do a small little tour in Washington of the film. My thought process is that I would look at Tacoma and go, okay, what small, what independent filmmakers are in Tacoma that recently had projects come out that I could also put in like a program and do little programs in all these different cities where I'm bringing in this project from Olympia and we're showing local projects as well. It's kind of like a band at that point. You're, you're, you're getting more exposure because you're going to different cities. And even if you're showing your short in Olympia, well, just because you're showing it in Olympia, nobody else is necessarily seeing it unless you have that word of mouth going to YouTube. But even if they went to YouTube and saw your short, if they liked it enough, they might come for the theatrical experience and they'll tell their friends. And so with doing it as kind of a concert kind of thing, you would then be able to have other filmmakers would come with their project, their cast and crew would come, and their friends and family would come, and hopefully they would have fans of their stuff that would come. So then you have, I don't know, four or five short films. So that's four or five different groups all bringing their people to one place. You all have the same goal, which is to get exposure for your shorts, and everyone gets the benefit of everybody else's fans being there. And so 
It's one of those things, I don't know how well it will work, but I think it's worth trying. Um, I think that Washington is an artsy enough state that I think they can get behind local artists. And so I think that it would be an interesting idea to do that. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm working on. And I would definitely recommend that anybody else do that as well. Um, then there's video on demand, which would be streaming services. You've got Netflix, you have Amazon, you have Hulu, you have so many different platforms to choose from. There are some, well, I'll get to that one in a minute. Um, so you've got YouTube, that's where you wanna put out your short for free. You have Amazon. Amazon, uh, from what I understand, Amazon is the easiest platform as far as like a big streaming service to get a project on. It's more like uploading to YouTube than trying to get permission because they're just kind of like, sure, we'll put your stuff up here. We don't know if anybody will watch it. Um, but there again, if it's on Amazon, that goes back to the looking bigger than you might be. If you look bigger, you're on Amazon, when you go tell people in the street, hey, my thing's on Amazon, that's gonna sound way cooler than my thing's on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, it's just kinda like, everybody's on YouTube. If you're on Amazon, not everybody puts their stuff on Amazon. And so, I kinda go back to that. And then you have Netflix and Vimeo. Netflix, obviously, they have way more hoops to jump through to get into. It's got to be a certain quality and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm not exactly sure how to submit to them yet. Um, there's Vimeo. Vimeo is another free platform if you're not familiar with it. YouTube is kind of like the general public video uh, viewing platform. Vimeo is more of a professional video people platform. Uh, people on Vimeo are generally in production industries where they're showing their like projects from NBC and Paramount and wherever it is that they work, but they're showing their stuff there because that's just more the audience that's there. Um, and then the other place I want to talk about is IndieFlix. IndieFlix is kind of like Netflix, that it is a streaming service, but it's specifically geared toward, toward independent uh, filmmakers. The way it works is you upload your short, and then for every minute that somebody watches your project, you get a, bit, a certain amount of money. Um, I haven't put anything up here yet. It's one of my goals. I'm hoping with this next project, the one that we're going to try and take on tour, I'm going to try and see if we can put it on here. Um, and this is just a good outlet. It's another place. I don't know what the subscribership is for IndieFlix, but it's a whole nother na nationwide, potentially worldwide exposure point where you can market yourself and say, hey, I'm on IndieFlix and tell everybody about it. And if those people have IndieFlix, they might go watch it. Um, not to mention the people that already are on IndieFlix that might watch it just because it's there. Um, and it's nice because you might actually make some money with that. YouTube, I don't think you make as much money as you used to. Um, and then the last thing would be physical media for distribution. Um, with Vimeo, the stuff that I was told to watch on Vimeo, you need passwords to get into that. Oh, they make you sign up for an account to, to do it? Or you have to... Well, like with Bill Lang, when he was putting his stuff on... Oh, then he creates the password and he gives you the password, correct? Is that with everybody? If I create a product and put it on Vimeo, I need to create an account? Um, if you're going to upload to Vimeo, yes, you need an account. But to view, you do not need an account. Um, the password protection thing is something that they specifically do in a situation where, like, Bill's doing a documentary and he is... Um, He's basically just showing his uh, cast and crew his product so far, and he doesn't want everybody else to see it. Then he's going to password protect it and give it to somebody so that they can see it specifically. But he doesn't want it on Vimeo on a broader scale. But you could do that on Vimeo. You just put it on there if you have an account, and anybody can. Yep. Okay, I didn't know that. Yep. 
Um, so then the last thing was physical media, which is essentially dead. Um, I, as a person that loves film and television and stuff, I'm at a point where my giant DVD Blu-ray collection is much smaller because of streaming services. I'm at a point now where if I have a DVD Blu-ray or potentially VHS, depending on if it was released later, it, um, I'm only keeping the things that if the internet were to explode and not work again, the main things that I need to survive. And yes, I need those DVDs and movies to survive. Um, and so that's, with those, when uh, there are different places you can go to for that if you're interested, um, that will create your DVDs, create your, your boxes and all of that. And uh, they just generally charge a certain amount per disc. Um, and it's something you can do at this point. If you're going to do physical media, I wouldn't do more than 100 copies. But the problem with that is if you only do 100 copies, it costs way more per copy. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a no-win situation. If you're going to have DVDs and, and Blu-rays, you're probably just going to have them priced really high. And if someone really wants it, they'll get it. I think. And that's really when you get to the point that you're selling that way. I think a lot of starting out with short films, you're mainly hoping that people will watch your stuff on YouTube, mainly then even worrying about them buying a DVD of it at that point. So that, if you have questions, I can answer. But physical media, I'm not really going to cover too much. And then the last thing, I had a couple of things that are recommended viewing. Um, one is, I'm going to do the, uh, the, the second two first. One is the website Creative Live. If you've never heard of it, it's a really cool site. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've seen is from Creative Live. Specifically these two, there is a class called Producing an Independent Film from the Grassroots Up. Uh, it was uh, done by Michael Gottwald. Uh, and he produced this film, Beasts of the Southern Wild. Are you, any of you familiar with it? Oh, it's a great film. I love that one. Um, and so he was really, it was really good to watch his because they were coming from it's their first feature, I think. I don't know for sure. But it was an early feature of theirs. They were in Louisiana, which I don't think they were from. And they were doing an independent film, which means they were kind of just like, going around asking for things, which is one of the reasons I really focus on just asking for things when you're looking for stuff for films. Um, and then the other one is distributing your film online with uh, Scylla Adrine, or Andreen. Um, she is the CEO and creator of IndieFlix. And so you can get, if you're interested in this kind of thing, she will tell you exactly what to do for online distribution and kind of what works best for her streaming service. Granted, it's a little older at this point. I've had it for at least two or three years. So things have probably changed. But it's still a good place to start to get uh, information about this kind of stuff. Um, and then the last thing, it's a, a, a TEDx talk for uh, Nardwar, are any of you familiar with Nardwar? Yes, okay. Nardwar, he's from Vancouver, and he is a, he's in bands, he does a, a radio show, and what he's kind of famous for is doing interviews for, of musicians. And he is the best interviewer I've ever seen. He actually will take props and gifts and stuff to the people he's interviewing, and he will go, hey, what do you think of this? The, one, the, the example I'll give you is uh, he did an interview with Questlove, and he hands him a, a record of that Questlove's parents were on, which Questlove is like, how do you even know about this, and how do you have this? And so that's the big question with him is, how does he know these things, and how does he get these things? Because it's always something cool. It's always something interesting. And what it does with the interview 
is it lets the, the interviewee open up. Um, so like with that instance, Questlove's talking about his parents and growing up in the music industry and stuff, which is kind of cool. That was something that I didn't know about him before I saw that interview. Um, and so, yeah. So he has a TEDx talk on YouTube that I would recommend to watch. It's about 24 minutes. And his whole thing is mainly just about asking. Basically, the same thing I'm talking about is just ask. You'd be surprised how nice people will be if you're like, hey, I'm shooting this short film, and we could use this. Actually, I can give you an example. We shot in here with a golf cart once. We couldn't drive the golf cart in or anything, but we had a trailer that we pulled the trailer in, set it here, and then to fake the idea of driving, people were on the side shaking it like this. Um, and so you just kind of, you just got to ask. We didn't have a golf cart, but we asked someone that did, and they were like, yeah, we can, uh, you do that. We had to ask TC Media, hey, can we bring a golf cart in here? Because you're not supposed to have a lot of stuff in here like that. And so it was, you just got to ask. Sometimes it'll work out for you. And that's, that's the end of it. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>